today I'm going to take a look at this Tanberg Data AccuVault RDX. This is a small business backup server. It runs Windows 2008 storage server basic and it basically backs up to an internal one terabyte hard drive and it also has one of these RDX drives which take cartridges of varying sizes up to two terabytes I believe are the largest ones. I don't know if this supports up to that large. I only have half terabyte ones and uh, the idea is that it will back up between the two drives and it does deduplication supposedly and it's got a little touchscreen window on the front and not really much else on the front really there's just the power switch uh, an eject switch and a little uh, pinhole for a manual eject of these cartridges around back you can see that they're using just a regular PC motherboard <laughs> including audio input and output and the actual part number is the AccuVault RDX TT-1TB and it has just the usual COA sticker and a little power supply fan PS2 ports, VGA port, four USB ports and an Ethernet port, I think it's gigabit and that's pretty much it, there really isn't that much on this thing now you can see that this case is actually not very big It's um, kind of long but it's still very compact and it's actually a very nice case it just has these two thumb screws on the back with the cover off you can see that there is simply a hard drive RDX drive small motherboard small power supply and a little fan that's really all there is inside this thing very clean I got this thing used on eBay I think I paid 50 bucks for it or something and uh, I'm surprised at how you know the condition this thing's in. Usually these servers and backup devices and stuff are really abused because they're running 24-7. But uh, this one doesn't seem to have too much life on it. I forgot to check the age on the hard drive. So uh, maybe I can look at that at some point. But uh, that'll tell you how many hours the hard drives run assuming it hasn't been replaced. But you can see it's a very uh, simple case with, and it's very rigid. Like they've got these um, center beams and stuff. This is not a cheap uh, little case. This is actually a very sturdily built uh, quality case and uh, it would be great for like a little home server or something assuming you don't mind having an RDX drive in it. The hard drive is just your basic uh, one terabyte uh, WD10 EARS which is just a green series hard drive. Nothing really special. They're kind of slow and uh, at least in my experience the green series drives tend to fail a lot. The internal RDX drive is simply listed as an RDX quick store internal USB dedupe. So I assume this thing does use some form of uh, deduplication. It says it in the software. And the interesting thing is that it mentions that the software deduplication is what's doing it all. Yet there's apparently a hardware thing that says it's on the drive. I don't get why that would be listed on the hard drive or on the uh, RDX drive if it's software based because um, if you're not familiar with with what deduplication is it takes repeating information that's on your files and just stores it once so if you have a million JPEGs on it for example the header of a JPEG in the file is always the same so it would just store that once instead of a hundred times or you know a thousand times whatever it's similar to compression compression usually looks for patterns and reduces the size of those patterns whereas deduplication looks for similar chunks of data and then stores at once so uh, you know on your whole hard drive you have a, you know one bit of information that you're uh, you know like I said a, a JPEG header or something it will be used a million times on your drive and it simply just stores at once. The downside to deduplication is that it takes a lot of horsepower to do usually. You need a lot of memory, a lot of CPU power, and this thing does not have it. It's only an Intel Atom. So I'm not really sure how well their deduplication works, but supposedly it's optimized and good. But, uh, you know, I can't really, it's not really something I can test. And as we'll get into later with the files, I'm not really sure what the deal is. Maybe it's using it, maybe it's not. I, I, I really don't know. This particular one didn't come with a cartridge. Uh, I was hoping it would. I, I couldn't tell from the picture because the picture has a little um, door that opens and closes with a cartridge. I wasn't sure if it was hiding a cartridge in there 
or if it just simply didn't have one, but I figured it wouldn't have one. And sure enough, it didn't, because that would have added quite a bit to the value, because these cartridges do sell quite easily. Unfortunately, this is only a USB 2.0 drive. The drive I have, which is an external one, which we looked at in a previous video, is a 3.0 drive, and it makes a huge difference in speed. I mean, I would not want to back up 500 gigs onto a, two, a USB 2 device. That would just suck. So I, I'm not really sure what they were thinking with this design, but there you go, USB 2. They do make a serial ATA version. That's what gets me. Like, I don't know why they wouldn't do a serial ATA connection to this. It's an internal device, and they're building it. It's not like someone went out and bought a drive. This is the company that makes the drive. Why wouldn't they just use a serial ATA drive? Uh, it's possible that it just wasn't out and this was the original version that just didn't have it, but it just seems like a really big, you know, mess up with the speed. Just have this like huge bottleneck. But I think the main idea of this system is to store information on the hard drive and back up to the RDX. So I don't think speed's really an issue in that case. This is the one fan in the device other than the 40 millimeter fan inside the power supply. It's an ADA DC 12 volt fan. I think it's 80 millimeter. I think it's 80 millimeter. It might be 92. Nah, I think that's 80. And uh, it's quite loud. I mean, this thing, when it's running, you definitely hear it. And you can see it's lined up with the, well, actually, maybe you can't see it with the lighting. But there's the big heat sink for the CPU is in the back there. So clearly it's set up to, to just get some airflow over the motherboard. Although it doesn't seem like it's the most efficient setup, seeing as there's a vent right here. So when this is running, it's probably just pulling air right in to this. And well, ideally it should be sealed up in a way that um, air comes in from the opposite side through the case over it. But clearly they haven't really thought that out. I mean, it is still a good case. I'm not bad mouthing the case. It's just uh, they could have done a little bit better with the airflow. Although, let's face it, this is an Intel Atom. It's not exactly getting very hot. You can see a bit more of the layout of the case. You've got the USB cable running to the motherboard along with the I believe it's another USB cable going to the touch panel but we'll get into that I, I don't think I've gotten far enough to take a look at the touch panel yet I've, I've taken most of this apart to look at some of the parts as uh, an Intel motherboard and nicely cable tied and everything fan power and everything so it is very nicely put together like I said and it's very clean so what I'm going to do is I'm going to take apart pretty much everything and we'll look at the individual parts since uh, the fact that I have a light above me and I'm holding a light shows you how annoying it is to film inside a case. On the front panel the display controller is a separate board to the actual display. I figured it all be one module. You can see there's a power connector with just or switch with just a single uh, connection going off to the motherboard and there's a USB connection that says five wires because there's obviously a shield connection in addition to ground. And that just plugs into here. And there were four screws holding this thing on. And then you can take this whole module out. This has an AT Mega 32 on it because this does actually do graphical stuff. It, it will, I'll show you later, but uh, the display is actually fairly capable and it does like pie charts and stuff like that. The board itself is essentially a microcontroller with a couple support pieces, flash and what looks like a touch controller chip and these itty bitty little mouth diodes. I've never seen them that small before. That's just crazy but uh, it looks like just a little vo voltage regulator and not much else on this thing. We've also got like a programming header and this is just hot bar soldered on so I'm trying to be careful but you can see it's a fairly complicated board just handling a, you know, a display driver essentially and touch screen so it's possible some of it uh, can or the board can handle some of the stuff on its own without windows when it starts up it goes through a couple um, like startup sequences so you can see like a little progress bar and stuff so apparently there is enough memory on this to handle something on its own. It's possible that this this card actually has everything on it and the USB connection is just supplying power and status updates and that this thing can actually do all of the pie chart stuff and everything like the 
the um, CPU doesn't have to send that information to the card. It's actually doing it itself and just giving it updates. The display, it seems to have a glass front that might be required for the touch screen. Touch screen works fairly well. I mean, the thing is the case has a plastic window on it, so it feels really cheap. But the, the you know, like the screen seems solidly built. The back of the RDX drive just has a standard Molex power connector and a USB 2.0 connector. Now looking in, it looks like it's just the standard assortment of chips. So I don't think they've got like some big fancy hardware deduplication system in here. So I'm really not convinced about this whole dedupe label on this thing. I, I, I don't think it's any different than any other RDX drive. In order to get the motherboard out, I've had to unhook the fan. Well, unscrew it and then I can move this out of the way. I mean, I'm trying not to clip all of these wire ties. Not that it really matters. I can just put on new wire ties, but I'm trying not to do it just because it was so nicely organized. Disconnected all the wiring except for the power supply, which is giving me a little bit of resistance. That's, yeah, it's gonna fight with me. I might have to get a screwdriver in there and pop the uh, little clip, but that's not a big deal. But once that's out, you now have a free place to slide this forward, which I couldn't do because there's this bar on top, which is non-removable. So to install the motherboard, you have to go in from the side and then screw it down. With a bit of fighting, I managed to get the motherboard out. It's a small Intel desktop motherboard, and it's actually the D510MO, made by Intel. Now, the thing with Intel boards is they have a whole bunch of numbers written on these things, and they all look like they could be the part number. This says E210882, and there's another one over there, and blah, 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 blah. None of those are the part number. What you need to do is you need to look at the um, sticker, and it will have AA, and then it will have a code after that. That's the part number. I don't know why Intel doesn't print it on the board like every other company does in the world, but hey, why not? Uh, this board has the single uh, Intel dual core Atom D510 CPU, which is a dual core 1.66 gigahertz uh, CPU with the NM10 chipset. I think that's the same thing my, my uh, router uses actually. I might have a newer one, but I'm, not, I, I'm fairly certain it's the same one. This one does use an ATX power connector, which a lot of Atom boards don't. They use either a 12 volt power jack on the outside or a separate 12 volt connector on the inside, but this one uses standard ATX, which limits how small of a uh, case you can use because the really small cases don't have room for power supplies. But uh, this one seems to be a fairly well-designed board, very compact, uh, mini ITX PCI slot, uh, that's one difference between my board and the other one, and this one is that mine has PCI Express. Uh, we've got uh, onboard uh, mini serial ATA, and it also has dual memory slots. You can have up to four gigs. Uh, it's DDR2. Uh, sorry, I should call this a mini PCI Express slot, not a not a serial ATA. Although you can't, uh, serial ATA does run along this, I believe, so you can use a little adapter. And we've got the usual audio, Realtek audio, Realtek uh, Ethernet, which is hilarious considering it's Intel. Why the hell can't they use their own Ethernet chips? And it's also got dual SATA ports. Now, one thing I did notice is that although most of these caps are nice Rubicon ones, there is one of the dreaded KZG series on this thing. So unfortunately I can't replace it because it's a six, it's a 6.3 volt 820 mic cap and I don't have any of those. <laughs> so the only one I have is a four volt and it's like some generic one that I have. Like I have a few of them, like they're just generic and it's like, oh, if I have a dead board, I can swap it out to see if the board works. But I don't have any good caps to put in here, nor do I have any of the right voltage. They're four volts instead of 6.3. So. Uh, I guess I can just have to leave it. It looks okay, but I don't trust any of them to be honest. The memory stick installed is a 2 gig Kingston, and it's uh, you know pretty standard DDR2. Uh, they're full size, which unlike my board, which uses SODIMS, uh, this, these are actually quite easy to get. Uh, it's just standard DDR2. It's not ECC memory, so 
don't even think about using this for NAS using a ZFS, ZFS, whatever you want to call it. I randomly swap between the proper Canadian, British, English version and US. Over here on the motherboard, you can see that there's actually a two serial port headers and a printer port header. So if you want to use this for some kind of a console server or whatever, there are actually serial ports. You just need to provide headers. Uh, I've been shooting this video using my 22 millimeter pancake lens for the EOS M and uh, I've been shooting full manual the whole time. This is the first time I've done that for video so I'm just you know seeing how everything goes. Those are all the audio decoupling caps and whatnot. Very crappy Samzon ones. Ugh. Oh well it's not gonna win any awards for audio we already knew that. It's got real tech. The uh, there's a motherboard chipset, I believe. Um, yeah, so I've been shooting full manual everything on this one, and it seems to be working okay, as long as I'm paying attention and don't move everything in and out, because uh, I'm shooting at a very narrow aperture just to get enough light, and, you know, I like the the focus blurring and whatnot, so, eh, kind of limited to the depth of field. Like, if I get a little too close, it goes blurry. A little too far, it goes blurry, but... You know, right here it looks pretty good, at least on the display. We'll see when I get this on the computer and start taking a look at it. But uh, I'm actually enjoying shooting manual with video so far. Here's the small, relatively powerful 150 watt power supply from Emacs. Uh, it just has the 40 millimeter fan, like I mentioned. And like most very tiny power supplies, it is very, very densely packed with lots of vertical boards. I'm not going to go poking around in here. Had it plugged in recently, although the caps probably have bleed resistors on it. I'm not 100% sure, so I'm not going to risk it. But yeah, like I said, there's like all these like little vertical boards in here. It does look fairly well built. I see a Nippon Chemicon cap in there. Uh, looks like the rest of them are as well. Yeah, they're all Nippon Chemicon, couple solid caps. So yeah, very well built. Tiny power supply, uh, extra coil here, probably for active uh, power factor correction. So, yeah, very impressive. One thing to point out before I get everything back together is that there's actually a little grounding wire going to the touch panel. I don't know, but that might actually be required for it to work properly. I'm not really sure how touch panel technology works, but it might actually need a, like a proper case ground in order to work or it's simply just because they need shielding. Now, I have a really good capture card, a PCI Express one. It's just not working right now. I don't know if it's a driver problem because I was having weird driver problems with it uh, in Windows 10, but you know, I don't know if it's the wire or not. I ordered a new wire from Amazon, so we'll see. But uh, I'm recording this with my EpiFan USB capture device, which isn't nearly as good, and it is currently recording at only 12 frames per second. And you can see it does this weird interlacing thing where it has like horizontal lines over everything plus it stops recording a lot i don't know why it keeps like it just stops randomly but <laughs> we'll see see if we can get this recorded uh this is the bios and as you can see it's saying 800 megahertz memory speed two gigs of ram blah 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 battery is obviously working because that's the right date uh we've got pretty pretty standard bios stuff like you know you have your normal old school stuff and you got a little bit of uh, video information, although you can't really change it too much. Uh, CPU temp is 27 degrees Celsius. Remote temp must be the platform controller hub. And those things always get hot on these Atom chips. My other one gets ridiculously hot too. Uh, memory configuration, yeah, it's got some basic memory configuration stuff. Oh, it has a HP team. Maybe you can... Uh, trick mac os an older version of mac os to run on this because newer versions don't support atom chips but yeah it's just basic stuff i had to turn on 
uh, boot to optical drives because I want it to boot off my um, external USB drive to run some tests and to clear the Windows password because it had an administrator password on it. So I had to boot into that and do some fiddling around to clear the password. So I'm going to try and start up. We'll see if this actually records. I may have to start it a second time once we've gotten to Windows. And I'm going to do another uh, video. Oh, you know what? It's actually showing up okay. You can you can watch this here. I was going to do a separate recording of this, but this looks like it's uh, enough to actually show up properly. And it's still recording, shockingly. So as you can see, it's running Windows 2008 server. This is the storage server edition. And it, mine actually has uh, like 200 updates pending. So we'll see. We'll see if it tries to update Windows before it actually starts up. But uh, it does actually work. First time I took the drive out and hooked it up to my computer, it really did not work. It just wouldn't start up at all. So I figured the drive was dead. But now the drive seems to work fine. So I don't know what the deal is. But uh, Windows seems to work perfectly. So. Uh, no real complaints there, and as you can see the uh, little LCD is just doing a little loading pattern, and it doesn't really change. You may not be able to see that. There's a couple uh, periods there just flickering by, but yeah, it keeps going back to their like little logo. And Windows looks like it is starting. Okay. Uh, yeah, like I said, this had a Windows password on it, and I had to clear it, and that was mighty annoying. Come on, little slow computer. But uh, I was able to clear it using, um, I forgot what software I, I use, but you can just Google Windows Password Reset and there's, there's tools everywhere for it. And there we go. Okay, it's starting up. It's very slow at starting up, as you can see. But it does seem to work fairly well. I was having no problems with it. Uh, I obviously haven't been using it as a real server. It's just, uh, you know, just in my testing, I haven't, it's not uh, unstable or anything. It doesn't surprise me. It's a well-built system with uh, seemingly quality parts on it. As you see, it has a lovely desktop background. And I think it loads up a whole bunch of software for, uh, it's like, um, yeah, AccuVault Navigator. I think that's what it is. And so yeah, this is your kind of overview thing that uh, comes with it and it's got stuff like checking for Windows updates, updating its own software, the AccuVault stuff. Now it mentions deduplication data protection, so I assume it's doing it in software. And if we go into the AccuGuard protection software, we can look at the storage pools. There's also this navigator program, so this is the program that shows all the storage units, uh, AccuVault, and I can't really do much on this. I've tried fiddling through it, but there's not really much you can do with the software. The navigator lets you get to, um, well, it loads this program, and it's got some basic diagnostics, like a system monitor, which appears to be HW monitor, which is what Hackintosh is shipped with, although a Mac version. This is the Windows version, H HW monitor. Uh, I'm fairly certain that's all like open source. I think they're using quite a bit of open source stuff here. And there's the RDX utility, which is exactly the same as the regular one you can download on its own. It has some diagnostics and stuff. Annoyingly, it has like a firmware update thing. And I hate when companies do this. Canon, I'm looking at you. They have a firmware update button that doesn't actually check online for firmware. It just says, where's the file? Which is just stupid. But uh, yeah, if you go into config, Figure this I think just has yeah it just brings you a control panel so yeah it's just a basic Windows install Windows server install I should say and under here you can set up your tasks and um, oops I did not mean to click up uh, it lets you set up backup tasks and stuff like that I didn't find any information on whether or not it's using deduplication maybe I can add it to a column? Nope. Um, anyway, I couldn't tell if it's de using deduplication because one thing I noticed is on the drive there's a separate uh, partition. Uh, computer. Well, yes, AccuVault store. Now, 
these have files in here documents and settings all users documents videos yeah see there are videos now these are Microsoft recorded video TV shows in their own format will not open found a photo couple photo albums photo album pictures okay these are all x3f files and for some reason my brightness just changed on my recording I don't know if it changed it for the actual file but it's changed it for me weird <laughs> this software is weird anyway uh, yeah these are all raw files from one of the uh, Sigma digital SLRs and they won't open they seem to be damaged I even went as far as to download Sigma software and it still won't work so I think the drive is deduplicated and it's just not working like these files are probably all corrupted because of the deduplication <laughs> so I tried copying it from here I used this system and copied it over instead of just plugging in the hard drive files don't work I tried turning on file sharing and accessing it on my main system files don't work I tried loading them on the computer itself files don't work so either they've backed up a whole bunch of corrupted files or there's something here I'm missing where it just doesn't work and I can't get any of the files off of it lastly we have the little touch panel screen now this is a very very tiny screen so um, my hand is gonna get in the way a lot <laughs> because they just put the tiniest touch screen they could possibly find. Uh, let me also put in an RDX cartridge, because I know part of the screen, the uh, interface talks about the RDX cartridges. So we've got the date and time, and no seconds. <laughs> we've got a temperature display, which is showing 21 degrees. The RDX is now ready, status okay. That's your DHCP information. You can click details and IP address and modify let's see what we can do here chain oh it looks like you can enter a static oh wow it's got a little keyboard oh you can actually enter a static IP address and stuff that is pretty impressive can I get out of here are you gonna let me out okay uh, cancel there alright uh, yeah so you can change your network settings I wonder if you can change the language is that a language button nope okay menu get into some more stuff oh there's language uh, disks so it's got the RDX drive at the bottom and the D drive which is the uh, partition with the backups on it so let's go to the D drive and you can see that it's almost entirely free and there's only 41 gigs used and it even tells you what kind of hard drive it's using but it does a little pie chart which is kinda cool and it's the RDX drive again this is pretty much a blank disk so you can see you can get to a few settings in here and that's it I don't think it does anything else so <laughs> you can't you can't actually view some stuff and you can oh well let's see what we can do in maintenance okay, so we got hardware status oh we can display your voltages that's kinda cool fan speed temperature okay reboot I think that's pretty self-explanatory display test touch touch <laughs> it's it's one of these go on go on okay I guess it's a pass display um, I don't know what it wants me to do here test oh pass green Pass. Okay, I think we get the idea. Flash. Flash. Is that just redrawing the screen? I can't even tell. <laughs> what is the purpose of that? Uh, temperature. Oh, it's a little thermometer. Fail. Fail. Okay. <laughs> it's good to know that it knows that it failed, but it does nothing about it. So, I guess that's the end of the little touch interface. That seems really pointless. But I do like the little display of the uh, storage space and stuff. That, that was actually quite nice. I think that pretty much concludes the video. I was thinking of what to do with this thing. I don't really have a use for it. So, I'm probably just going to either put the whole thing back up as one unit on eBay. 
or sell the parts individually. I think selling the parts individually will get me some more money than doing this because I only got that this thing only costs like 50 or 60 bucks. I think I can probably get more for that motherboard and the hard drive and stuff. So I'll probably sell it all separately. Although I have to say, this is actually one of the best built, like small systems I have seen. That everything inside it's just like nicely put together. It's got really organized wiring, the case. Okay, one thing that like really doesn't come across is this case is sturdy. This is not like your typical ITX case. This thing is heavy. They're using like heavy steel on this, not like thin aluminum. So this is actually a pretty impressive case. And unfortunately, there's no way to get rid of this stuff on the front. It would really increase its usefulness if you could get rid of this stuff. But, you know, you can live with it. You could disconnect this or uh, there's a black piece of plastic behind here. You could probably just take out the display and just have the black plastic. It wouldn't be pretty, but it would work. And, uh, you know, the RDX drive, yeah, you can use the RDX drive. I've spoken about these before. They're really proprietary and stupid, but they do work. I mean, I do have a few of them. I don't really use them for much though. <laughs> I might just sell them too. But yeah, I mean, like I said, this thing is like really well built, uh, quality parts, like the power supply looked excellent motherboard. Excellent. Aside from that one capacitor and, uh, yeah, good arrangement of ports. You could even use this as a uh, basic windows machine. Uh, if you don't mind the slow atom chip.